Welcome back to another Spin That Shit podcast. We have an awesome guest today. Super thrilled to have him. J.D. Wilkes is with us, the colonel himself from Kentucky. We're going to be picking his brain about music, art, uh, writing, a whole list of things. Uh, share some laughs and good times. And of course, he brought his banjo and harmonica, so we're going to hear a few tunes. So super pumped to have him on. I will say, please, please support the podcast. Like, share, ring the bell, all that bullshit. Whatever we can to grow this thing. It's free. It's a free podcast, so what can you do, you know? We just like, uh, we like talking about music and we like sharing it, so we're doing what we can. Let's go talk to JD. I'm ready. Ready to go? You ready yeah. to hear it? All yep. right, we're recording. All right, JD, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Um, we like to kick these off, basically, especially since it's your first time on our show, uh, Give us a little background of where you came from, what you grew up listening to, and how you kind of got involved in the music scene. Okay. Uh, I was born in Texas, not Kentucky, but my parents are from Kentucky. And uh, my dad was down there for work in the 70s, and I got born in Baytown, Texas. And immediately, we, they went home because my mom couldn't raise be uh, by herself so far away from family. She needed help, so we went back to Kentucky. And uh, Paducah, Kentucky is where kind of where uh, I'm centered uh, most of my life, Marshall County, McCracken County, extreme western Kentucky. And then uh, and then once again, my dad had to go find work in the 80s this time down in Louisiana. So I lived down there for about all of the 1980s. I lived in Louisiana and St. Francisville, a very I go, I mean, and by, at the time I didn't realize this, but I've gone back since in the last couple of years, and it's a very southern Gothic little town, lots of Spanish moss and old cemeteries and antebellum homes and in ruins, some of them like a necropolis, just crumbling and old statues, cracked <laughs> and covered in kudzu and ivy and and Spanish moss and swamps and stuff like that. I think it must have soaked in a little bit, as well as the music. We saw um, uh, Zydeco bands and blues, little blues guys and things like that. It kind of went over my head at the time, although I remember enjoying it. I don't think I knew what it was because I was a little bitty, a little. I was maybe uh, 13 or something when I first saw like a blues man. <laughs> and mm -hmm. uh, Scott uh, Dunbar, who was almost 100 years old in the, in the 1980s, um, I think he was born in the turn of the century, so maybe in his 80s. And uh, he was a, a, a son of a sharecropper, and he had been hired to play the blues and look like a slave at this this, this shack that they had during one of these uh, antebellum open houses that they had called the Pilgrimage. And um, and he played like Liza Jane, and it, it wasn't really blues. It was kind of hillbilly country but that was the thing back then is uh, i guess before the all that became sort of marketed towards blacks or whites it was all mixed together and so he was like a time capsule and i always i, I took a picture of him with my little you know those little 110 camera kodak things before mm -hmm. everything went up digital like it's like a you know like almost like a disposable Sliding. camera is mm -hmm. like you would get at walmart yeah, they had those kind of things back then and i, I remember uh just rediscovering those pictures and just thinking, man, I was, I was really there at a really great time. I wish I'd been older to, to appreciate it. We moved back to Kentucky in the nineties and, uh, or thereabouts. And, and then, uh, just kind of, um, got my dad told me about, I, I was describing something or I was reacting to some song and he goes, Oh, that's blues. And I, and he said, I got, heck, I've got a bunch of old, old records. And if you want to hear them, and then that's when it all started. And I got a harmonica my grandpa had given me and then uh, learned how to bend notes on it and wanted to start a band. Before that, I'd been playing piano and taking piano lessons from my mom, but I'd never learned to read music because I, I didn't understand. I didn't know what the point was of like Mary had a little lamb and reading dots and it just didn't seem to you know, <laughs> awaken anything in me like this blues stuff did. And um, so I, I went back to the piano later and learned all the blues scales in every key and uh, just started going down that 
route and started forming little uh, sports bar blues bands. And uh, then at some point I felt like a fraud, like I was a minstrel in a way, like I'm not a, I'm not a black man. So, but I noticed this rockabilly stuff was like, you could still play that same kind of stuff and be honest about being Southern white guy, you know, and, uh, and it was fun and it, you know, it was more lively and kind of had that punk thing uh, that I discovered later. I, I didn't even really know about punk uh, till later on when I'd play these little hall shows and things would be all punk, teenage punk bands. And then I'd have my blues band that they'd let me come play, <clears throat> <laughs> you know, which was weird, but they loved, there was real support. That's a good thing about small town punk rock scenes is that they're real supportive well, at least ours was, you know, because we're all fighting the same kind of mall culture a lot of times. So we all <laughs> stuck together. And um, and I think some of that rubbed off on me. Like I saw some really great front men and those just local local punk bands are really amazing. There's one guy, Wheeler Underwood, who would do two nunchucks at the same time and make up freeform <laughs> poetry on the spot. And then uh, for the last song, he'd blindfold himself take uh throw an apple in the air and cut it in half with his samurai sword and uh <laughs> and it, like i saw that it kind of like blew my mind like i think i was changed it's like oh i want to do stuff like that and, and i saw reverend horton heat and all that i mean i just uh just got into entertainment and music and all that and wanted to be kind of like the guy doing that on stage if i was on the in the audience what would i want to see me do hmm. i would want to and so I started doing nunchucks and acting crazy and all that. People loved it. And that's kind of what I've been doing for a long time. Shack Shakers it was a band I started in Murray, Kentucky with some art majors and a, a psychology major and a physics major. And we all uh, cut our hair into pompadours and stuff and, <laughs> and played frat, uh, frat parties and we played uh, biker bars and one of the biker bars ended up being like some kind of a front for the clan and and uh but they loved it when we brought our like gay friends from the art school they'd come down and dance i mean like there was everyone got along like uh, uh the Ro rainbow coalition it was really weird there was so many bizarre gigs uh back in the day back in, everything just seemed like a uh, more feral and you know and it, you know, since those days, I've noticed that everything's just gotten kind of streamlined, streamlined and lamer, it seems. <laughs> it, I don't know what it is. I think uh, a lot of bands don't come up knowing all this stuff and having to like fear for their lives in some of these places, you know, like there was times we wouldn't know if we'd uh, make it out alive. My first official first gig was in a prison. Oh and man, the, the Kentucky State Penitentiary was like oh. my official first gig of playing harmonica for money. That is well, awesome. three gigs in one day, and one of them was uh, there was like two campsites in a prison, and it was a, uh, and that's a whole story I'll get to later. But that that's kind of me in a <laughs> weird nutshell of that's overflowing with too much information. Okay, throughout that whole line, at what point was the banjo picked up? Age wise. Well, uh, kind of right. Around, well, I always like kind of like fancy myself like kind of the banjo boy from Deliverance, as like an alter ego kind of thing, as a just like kind of warped and you know, and I'm picking up on all this kind of this. There's something in the air or the water and the in places I've lived that just feel like the banjo sounds, and I would just gravitate towards that. I, like I could see myself playing that one day. I love the way it sounded, and um. And I asked for it, an instrument for Christmas, and I asked for a mandolin, thinking it was the instrument that made banjo sounds. I'd see, I didn't ever see any bluegrass. I only saw blues and zydeco, mostly. And around here, um, there's not a ton. There is now bluegrass, but Western Kentucky is more like a. Also, it's it's part of what it's part of the Mississippi Delta and the river system and paddle right. and things like that. So it has a lot of more uh, uh, bluesier, jazzier tradition. So uh, bluegrass was kind of more like out in the counties, uh, somewhere else that I, I didn't see as a kid as much. But when I went to Nashville, I just started to say, "Oh, that's what makes that sound." You know, I think it was before that I figured it out. But 
um, something about the banjo just like it feels like um, it sounds like everywhere I've lived feels or there's something prickly and something driving and droning and feral about it in the right hands like especially like Doc Boggs or Roscoe Holcomb like when I discover that kind of music um, that's that was it it's like oh yeah minor evil sounding mountain music that's like <laughs> hell for leather that's Roscoe like, is haunting mountain. Like yeah his sound and, is just yeah all of that that's what i'm into and once i realized that 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 was there i was like oh okay you don't have to sound so happy you know with the, mm. with the you know that the dad grass stuff just uh, just doesn't do it for me although i do like i like it but it wasn't quite it and it wasn't until i discovered doc boggs i think that i realized that there was like a uh, a cooler way of going about it that was like matched the way i felt in my experience and it had blues in it too that's the thing a lot of those tunes are blues tunes blues yeah tunes. yeah uh, speaking of that yeah yeah for sure speaking of that I think you have a version of little birdie or you know your your take on it so it's one of those traditional songs but you kind of put that spin on it mm -hmm. and i wonder what you think makes some of those songs whether it's blues bluegrass traditional mm -hmm. what what keeps them sticking around is it the content are they just that great is it the tradition of it what, what yeah somewhere? well in uh, the case of little birdie it's just two chords and it drones and it can be floating verses it can be whatever you make of it and uh that's what i like about uh pre-war music or, or, or old-time music i guess you could say uh is that there weren't wasn't radio or television or pop culture yet to or the internet of course to to standardize music into one thing that everyone copies, you know, that to me, that's like the sheet. Mary had a little lamb sheet music. Uh, you know, it's dots. It's like, do it this way. This idea of it, incorrectness, uh, just, uh, I didn't get it. I thought, well, now there's, a, I like the variety of everyone's uh, interpretations. And I think uh, the, the things that are, that make old time music or bluegrass tunes standards is that's uh, capacity for, uh, individualism in, in its interpretation and uh, in the case of Little Birdie uh, that's like it's barely a song you know you just you, it's more like a, a, a Rorschach test for for your for your id you know does it you know you hear how that person feels music uh, in that tune although my version is sort of like the JD version of the Morgan Sexton version uh, who's Lee Sexton's uh, uncle, great uncle or uncle, and uh, very crooked tuning. And uh, so, like, I like crooked tunings. I think the things that are a little off because it's like there are more jagged edges for your brain to hook onto and make it that therefore more interesting. If it's too smooth and, it, and too polished, it has that sheen to it. It's like my I just slip right off of it. it I need hooks for my ears, you know, to to, to enjoy art and music uh, and I'll, uh, because it, I'm into it for the art and the music. Like it has to grab me. I'm not into music as an identifier of my uh, culture or my, my identity group. Mm -hmm. These aren't lifestyle anthems that I'm after. I'm after art for art's sake and music and it has to grab me. And I know it when I see it, I know when I hear it. And, uh, and, and if it's too, perfect to it maybe or too shiny and happy i mean it could be happy but i just i just don't like it to be samey samey and uh too too <laughs> standardized you know and that that's why i like old time better than bluegrass i guess is because bluegrass was like the concert version of old time like it was uh mm, dialed yeah. in to perfection and i i like the that's the spontaneity and the variety of People, uh, people like Roscoe and Doc, and they're the, their odd way of hearing it. Or, and it might be a traditional way that they were taught. It might go back millennia, or, I don't know, or centuries, you know, like from Scots-Irish traditions or something, you know, like, and I like that history and that lineage. There's something universal about it, something that it awakens something in me and it has to sound like it, you know. There's people that can channel that and there's people that are into it for fame and glitz and glamour and i prefer the former yeah <laughs> right <laughs> yeah i'm i'm with you on that i mean i like bluegrass but i do have issues with it 
when I first wanted to play banjo, yeah, I wanted to play claw hammer. Mm. And I'm more of a one-on-one type learner. And I like to see it, you know. So YouTube, you couldn't ask the questions how you wanted right. to or whatever. So mm. no one around here knows how to do it or taught it. So I was stuck learning three finger scrugs, which is fine. It was fun at first. I still think it's cool or whatever. And but... I still do rolls like that. You know, that's yeah. just one one trick to put in the bag. Right. Mm-hmm. But, it, you know, some of the guys I was around were, you know, 50, 60 years older than me. And they're, they're saying, don't, you know, mess it up. You can't be breaking this tradition and trying to do all this artistic, creative stuff. It's, it's like mm-hmm. pitting a black eye on bluegrass or something. Yeah. I eventually found my claw hammer style. So, <laughs> well, the thing is, is um, that's kind of a modern attitude because what I take from Earl Scruggs was in his inventiveness, not his, not the product. It was the the mindset that led to the product. That's what I'm more interested in is his originality yeah. and, and a sense of fun and, and uh, exploration. Yeah, um, I love listening to Earl Scruggs. And I like listening to Charlie Poole, who, by the way, him and um, uh, Dr. Ralph Stanley, they all had their own kind of styles, you know. It's Ralph not, is what got it. me interested. He wasn't averse to playing some claw hammer, and Charlie Poole played uh, kind of like minstrel style, like uh, the old um, vaudeville style, you know. Did he and, use uh, glass on, but do you know if he used a slide on banjo? He probably did. I mean, uh, he I has heard a- that. But- that's the thing is you don't ever, no one ever talks about Charlie Poole and I'm not a student of his and I don't play like that, but he was canon, you know, you want to talk like Star Wars, like canon, or bluegrass canon in, used to include pool style, but now it's like only scrug style or new grass, Bela Fleck and on, it has to be this. Certain, right. And what I think, uh, what my, um, I just have this theory about everything getting streamlined through time. It, you know, and that's how history, you lose a lot of the detail, the nuances, and uh, it just gets shaved off as like a something palatable that'll do the trick for now. It's good enough. And, and then all the variety you know, fades in, uh, into footnotes and the footnotes disappear, you know. Hmm. But uh, it wasn't, I mean, when I first got into banjo, like Charlie Poole's name came up a lot and now it doesn't come up at all. And people forget it, just all uh, the variety of the, the that was within bluegrass. Listen to um, Bill Monroe's mandolin style. Like he's my favorite mandolin player, but mm-hmm. you don't hear anybody playing bluegrass mandolin like Bill Monroe. Uh, yeah. He was chordal and chunky and uh, like a drum kit, and but like beautiful trills, like a Italian style. But then he'd go into the sock rhythm and and just crunchy, blurry chords, you know and but now it's all diddly diddly diddly, like precision, like you can hear every note like a like a pinprick, you know. Yeah. You know, like and you know, that's sh- it just shines in my mind. You like it's made like it's made of glass or something. And I just <laughs> don't. I just uh, why would in the world? How do you not get bored of just uh, replicating music uh, over and over in this way? That's like kind of fascist, you know. And uh, this seems like weird to me. Like, I mean, don't you get bored? Like, would you? Right. I mean, that's the thing is like limitations are what I'm drawn to again, imperfections and all that. Like I can't solo on a banjo for shit, but I can pull out my harmonica and get that, keep that thing going over here. And, and then that ends up entertaining people. Cause like, Oh, look at that. He doesn't even need one of those racks. You know, he's doing <laughs> this. Well, you know, like that was like a little bit of inventiveness that I came up with because I'm limited in my my talents. Uh, I just used a different talent to augment the other. And then all of a sudden you have a something new. I mean, ish, not new, but it's my way of doing it. I mm-hmm, play J.D. Yeah. Wilkes style. What's your style? What's your name? And therefore, what is your style? Everyone says our old scrubs. I don't know why. <laughs> and, uh, it's kind of interesting the point you brought up i mean so even mandolin if if you're not seeking out the music that plays that where would you even hear it anymore certainly not country unless maybe ricky skaggs is playing it so is that i mean just collectively what are we what are we losing here yeah i'm yeah well that's just the nature of uh cause and effect and um time and 
you know, how people just, you know, it's just so easy. I mean, we're just talking about music. In every other topic you can name, if the same phenomenon occurs, um, whether it's history or politics or, or uh, you know, uh, quilt making or, you know, that, that, you know, I just see music as like, like cooking or like a recipe your grandma gave you, but you got your own way of doing it too. So you're carrying on a tradition, but you put, throw in your own spices and you do it kind of by, by taste. I play by like ear, like, Oh, what if you did this, you know, just a pinch of this, this, this lick is from my, the lessons I have with Lee Sexton. Well, this one's one with Scotty Henson and this one I made up, you know, like, isn't that neat? It's not that fun. I mean, uh, and isn't it cool that you're carrying on, their thing while doing something individual listic and um it's like i don't think it should be seen as anything uh different from cooking barbecue or or writing a screenplay i mean it should be it should be like an expression of something that you want to see ha uh, exist out of your dreams yeah. out of like what you like i was saying about being a front man well, i want to see me do this I want to, mm. I want this to happen. Having an imagination, you know, like if you don't have an imagination or any kind of like bravado, or like assert your will to see your imagination manifest, then you're in the wrong business. Right. Well, I think you've done that really well, by the way, because you're like, oh, I actually have a, this sounds ridiculous. I have like a word document of every band or artist I've seen over all these years. And it's, pages long and uh i'd say that you're in the top five as far as live performance band to see your front man presence is there like entertainment the whole time wow. you got like a drier sense of humor sometimes on there that's hilarious that keeps people <laughs> engaged and you give little yeah. backgrounds about each song and the whole way through is great i mean it's all you got muddy roots a few times and it was just a wild ass show it was so much fun <laughs> I yeah, just that's just, uh, you know, again, it's like uh, what I would want to see on stage. I'm also like, I have a kind of imaginary people in my head I'd like to impress. They don't even have to be there, but like I maybe the video, they'll see it one day, or maybe that just in, in spirit, I would like to uh, crack up this guy that I used to look up to, you know, this front man or this <laughs> musician, you know, like keeping stuff like that in your head you know, keeps you driving on being a little competitive with other bands, you know, not in a mean way or anything, but like, in a, you know, you know, that's what we do. You know, that's what guys do. I think is like you, you bust balls sometimes because you want them to do better too. You know, it's a yeah. team. We're all out here trying to entertain these, these people and, uh, and not get, not become lamos like they have in Nashville, what they crank out. Cause that's like, we're fighting that war, you know, as far as I'm concerned, and we're losing, we're going to lose it, but you might as well go down in a blaze of glory. <laughs> it's kind of like a second generation of Willie, you know, Willie leaving Nashville and all that. And oh, other yeah. People are fighting back now. Well, yeah. I mean, it, it's always going to be a minority and it's an increasing minority over the years I've seen. I'm, I'll be turning 49 here in a week or two and, uh, I've not just seen with my own eyes, like the uh, sort of the quelling of um, contrarian thought or anything that's just like a, a satire even, or, you know, like, yeah, this cancel culture is a proof, you know, like, it's just like, no, it's like, the, it's like the force is like, no, you, you wear this, you think this and you play this, everything is streamlined, streamlined, like, um, almost like a, a, a different phases of a, a tumbling a rock to a, a high <laughs> polish sheen shine or whatever. It's like, uh, it's, it's, it's where, I don't know where we're headed, but it is, a, it is a cause and effect thing that's headed to a new uh, paradigm in my opinion. Uh, and we're the last gasp. Uh, I don't think that there's that saving country music thing. It will never be saved. It will always exist in the underground but more and more increasingly driven deeper down as, as this uh, time goes on cybernetic world, uh, uh, you know, turns country music into this, uh, uh, this, uh, this abomination, in my opinion. 
80s <laughs> pop, basically. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's just pop music with a bit of a twang. You might get yeah. might get a banjo in there and the you know, you can barely hear it. The fiddles are really like a violin section, mm-hmm. you know. And uh it's always in re- always in reference to something that's happening on the top 40 channel. You know, it's a it's an answer song. Like, we can do that too, you know. It's not original, you know, and it doesn't come from farming. Farming's corporate now. So, of course, country music is going to reflect the corporate nature of farming because, or, or the, and the, the, you know, the bourgeoisification of the, of the working class. Because who do you know that drives a mule anymore and dies young and has 80 kids, you know? <laughs> Nobody. Yeah. No right. You know, you mind picking us a few, JD? What's that? Got me all excited talking about all this music. I just want to hear you play one real quick. Yeah. <laughs> Let me do uh, whatever you want. I'll do some banjo. But I don't, I don't know. know if uh, the audio, you know, obviously we're just doing computers. It so. might distort. I don't know. Yeah. But, uh, you, let, you can stop me in the middle if it does. first song popped in my head <laughs> awesome that's awesome that's a doc boggs uh, cover there uh, but uh he's covering the methodist hymn book <laughs> no straight to the source <laughs> fun fact um uh, you're a man of m- many talents i think uh let's we've talked about music let's talk a little about some of the other stuff you're in obviously you write uh, you went to art school produced films like can, tell me a little bit about, about some of that other stuff cartoonist yeah. how that all plays in to, and just being creative with that yeah i guess uh, i found out later uh the reason why i dabbled in all these different uh, disciplines was just to learn the way to tell a story and i didn't mm-hmm. i didn't really put that together till like last year when it dawned on me like because i always like kicking myself i didn't just pick one thing and become the best at that only and then that way more people would you would end up becoming more popular and have more likes and follows as we say nowadays would be more, had to be probably been better off financially if you're the guy that does that thing and with me it's like i confuse people by jumping around and um but uh the reason why i uh jump around is because like i i like the different flavors of telling a story that's that's the one thing that's consistent and i didn't really think about that it's like there is one thing that i do but i just do it in too many different ways and i'm a master of none of them but i'm good enough at all of them to where it's like cumulatively maybe some people might find that interesting but like storytelling is um something i was drawn to that explains the comics of course that's a way of telling stories songwriting that was one of the the things about uh, when I was in Nashville, like everything I came up with was like this short story in a in a Shack Shaker song form, because the lyrics are like verbose and crammed together and trying to get everything out. Too many words in the phrases, and it never dawned on me the whole time I was in Nashville to try to write a hit, you know, 
it literally never occurred to me to try to write a hit. Like I just didn't even think to, I didn't think, well, that's what other people do. I guess, you know, you know, there are people that write song uh, or songwriters that are like part of like a, an assembly line or some sort of like songwriter circle that that's there. We're trying to get this thing out there. Like lots of people will like it. Whereas like me, it wasn't about like dropping lines and referencing things that are popular to people. It was about telling a story you might find interesting. So like, it's just a different way of going about it. And I think I'm so like steeped in my own, I was so up my own ass or in, inside my own head so much that uh, it it just was a foreign thought to try to do anything else. And um, painting, I found that a lot of drawings and paintings like this uh, that would be they would be broken into little sections, like a comic in a way. Uh, so even that, I, I'm just I just realized that right now and talking that the, the way that I would <laughs> lay out these drawings was like. Almost like a, you know sequential art of of a comic book or something you know, but you know little vignettes and things and sections like a montage with little pictures in each one of them. So, but I would do it in a more artful way than drawing cartoons. And then of course filmmaking is a way of telling a story too. So that dawned on me last year. It's like oh that's what I was doing. Shit, um, I'll just that now I'm stuck. <laughs> Uh, but I am writing a, a, a sequel to The Vine That Ate the Salad. It's a novel that came out a few years ago, and I'm writing a sequel to it. I'm doing pure storytelling now, now that I know this stuff, now that I know that about myself. And um, so, and then, and, and, and in doing fiction, fictional writing, novel, uh, being a novelist, I guess, um, it's, so satisfying it's like all of the, the other stuff just mainlined into like uh exactly what i want to do and what i'm geared to do is tell stories and uh uh then i was thinking um man i wish i could go back i said this to somebody at a, at a show or something and i said yeah i wish i could go back and uh talk to younger jd and say cut out all this music, cut out all this stuff and just be a writer and see, you know, and then the person said back to me, I wasn't expecting it. This is some random fan, I guess, at a show. And he said, yeah, but you wouldn't have as much to write about if you didn't do all these other things along the way, Let's go get to travel over to Europe and see the talk to all these different people touring and being in a band and knowing about personalities and, Right, have, you know all the different guys that have played in the band and all the people I've met over the years just like all these character studies and talking about art like things like this you're like I wouldn't have had that opportunity if I was just up in the up here in my attic just writing stories I wouldn't have anything to write about so he had a point <laughs> that's interesting yeah. so everything you laid out remind me of one of my favorite authors Kurt Vonnegut from Indiana like we already said the purpose of art it's not to make money. It's to make your soul grow. I love That's that. Right. So who are some of your favorite writers then? Oh, um, well, I like Cormac McCarthy. I like Tolkien. I like H.P. Uh, Lovecraft. I like the Gothic novels. I like uh, my favorite book might be, even though I don't I'm scared to go back and read it again. But uh, Moby Dick is like one of the most mind blowing things. Uh, uh, books I've ever read. You know, it took a while, but. There's a reason why it's so exhaustive and exhausting is because mm. it's supposed to make you feel like you just went around the world for three years on a boat. And it's, it's <laughs> packed with mind blowing, almost biblical, pro biblically proportioned metaphors that just like, how does a mind come up with this stuff? You know, it was uh, so it's like, you know, there's those flavors of the genre, the science fiction and fantasy genres that are fun but there's the masters of, of of those i'd say like um asimov and bradbury from science fiction and uh oh uh, what's his name arthur c clark oh. and then there's you know and then there's the southern gothic guys or, or and gals uh flannery o'connor and faulkner william gay 
and Cormac McCarthy. And then there's like the literature guys that just made great works that of the 19th century, early 20th century. And I, and I like the way they write and I like how I like getting lost in their, their wordplay and their, that old uh, language that's so beautiful before a television dumbed us down to sixth grade level reading that they sell at Walmart. Yeah. <laughs> what can you tell us about uh, yeah. go ahead. I was going to say that that's the reason why I'll never be a, a famous author too, is because I, I, I cannot write at that level. I don't even, mm. I, you know what I mean? I'm like my, all, every everything I like to read is like, uh, kind of flowery and uh, florid or verbose and but beautiful and I love it and I want to write like that but like the common you know person cannot read at that level which I don't think is like that hard because we were having to read this stuff in high school it's like what happened again there's that streamlining the kind of dumbing <laughs> down thing that's happened it's cause and effect and it's weird to me it's like sad because it's like the last gasp of of real of the real man art that used to be, you know. Uh huh. Yeah. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what to do about it. I think it's a, you know, just go down swinging. Kurt Vonnegut's right. I, I saw a little thing on Instagram the other day. It was like, write for write the uh, stories you want to read, play mm -hmm. the music you want to hear. It's a whole whole bunch of them, you know. Yep. Create. Uh, there was one. It was like create the app you want to use. Like anything that you want, you know. Anything you want to do, anything you want to see exist, make it. The reason why I wrote the Barn Dance book is because I thought I went looking for a book about Kentucky barn dances, the history, and maybe a little travel guide to how to go see them. And, you know, I, there was, it wasn't a website. It wasn't a book. It wasn't a turn paper on Google or anything. So I'm like, well, doggone it. I don't guess I'll go write it, you know, and because, uh, you know, and it ended up being like, what got me into writing and because it got published um it gave me kind of like oh wow that's neat that so some success right off the bat like oh well i'll keep going you know and then it's right. not that hard you know all you gotta do is just write an outline of what you want and then go flesh out each little section you know turn it into like five pages each one of those turns into five or ten pages and once you get on a roll it's fun so that's that's how that happened, and uh, but, but it's because I wanted to see that book exist that I made it happen. And that would be my grandfatherly advice to anybody listening or watching is like it's it's like that meme said on uh, Instagram the other day: uh, make the art you want to see, and uh, pl play the music you want to hear, etc. I'm with you on that, especially hearing you talk about it. I can just tell how passionate you are about it and just inspires me to go do something. Like after this, I might go start draw something or whatever. Well, I know, went to art school too, uh, you know. Yeah, you have to get bit by the bug. It, it takes a while to get get going, you know. But um, one of the things that helps me, helps motivate me is if what I'm doing can also be a valentine to um, – an underappreciated person or style like i if it's if it's somehow a nice gesture also that i'm giving to something that's been overlooked uh or that i really appreciate uh, someone or something that i've really um am thankful for that it's my thank you card to them or it um, it could be, you know, it could be an abstract idea too, but that's another, that's a way of tricking yourself into getting motivated is to do it out of the love of your heart and, uh, not just to, uh, not just for competitive sake or to take a picture of what you're, you're working on for the, for a social network, you know, post, you know, so that you get likes and then you get your fix of your endorphins or whatever, <laughs> dopamine or whatever it is. And then you don't even worry about it anymore because you already got what you wanted. So it has to go beyond uh, people's um, approval, likes and approval, like that, that quick fix. It has to be for a grander reason if you really want that motivation trick to work. Right. So <clears throat> you mentioned how, you know, right now the story is that how you pretty much go about the same way writing a documentary? 
Um, I haven't seen uh, Seven Signs yet. I really want to dive into that one. Mm. What can you tell us about that? Well, that was made 14 years ago. Yeah. Um, and uh, I didn't know what I was doing, but it's an interesting story. Uh, well, it is to me. It was in the MySpace days. And I had just watched a movie called Searching for the Wrong Eyed Jesus. I don't know if you've ever heard of it. It's a mm -hmm. BBC documentary. Because these British people came over here and made a documentary. And it's a beautiful documentary. It's how I found out about Lee Sexton. And there's a lot of cool stuff in there. Um, lots of great B-roll of swamps and stuff. But then they have these scripted moments. Like David Eugene Edwards of Woven Hand, 16 Horsepower. It just so happens to be playing banjo in the woods. When a creepy little girl walks up in like one of these like old-timey dresses. And, <laughs> can, I, can I touch your banjo? Or something. It was scripted. <laughs> like weird little moments. I'm like, oh, I was with you and uh, you were talking to Lee Sexton and uh, get on. Um, and then, the, you know, these other like there, there's, there's a lot of cool stuff in there. They're in a Georgia truck stop at one and like a lot of cool stuff. But then there's dis disruptive moments where the, you know, the handsome family is like in a floating house in a swamp. Like, like, I, you know, and like, how did they get out there? You know, that's what I'm thinking, you know, because they put <laughs> you in that documentary mode. You're thinking, oh, it's a documentary. And then it's like this artful moment happens that's scripted. And I'm like, I went off on a tear on MySpace. Like, <laughs> I'll make a better documentary. It'll be more real if I had to go out there with a shaky camcorder and do it myself. And then that, again, you know, I, you know, I forgot about it. And then the next day I go back and open it up again. And uh, the dude from BBC in the comments section said, put up or shut up. It's like, how does he know about me? I mean, like, how did he find out? <laughs> you know, he called me out. And I uh, was, uh, you know, and everyone's like, yeah, you ought to do it. You know, like, you know, it's too late now. Everybody's seen it and I got to do it now. So I called up some friends of mine and, and, um, we had a little powwow and we wrote down some things we'd like to go shoot. And then, uh, and I was on tour, put, had to put all this together, like in the hotel rooms, making phone calls and setting everything up. Cause I had a month coming off, uh, coming up that was off the road and I'd be home and we could meet up. And it just so happened that every, every weirdo artist, old timer, young fogey, you know, that I, we could think of were home and available bam, 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 man, we're going to go all the way around, you know, like Louisiana and Alabama, Georgia and Carolinas, and Kentucky and like a whole South as much as we could. And it just lined up like it was meant to be. Yeah, we can be there. Yeah, we can be there. I'll see you there. And it was like lining up perfectly routing wise. Like, yes, 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 yes. But we got it all done, filmed in about a week or two. <laughs> we were on a roll I mean, we were like, hit the highway and it took a year to edit so that was the thing it was like i don't know how to edit i don't mind a filmmaker but i was like kind of like let's do that you know and we were all kind of powwowing together to make it happen but um i was kind of like having to spearhead it because i'd been uh i was in the hot seat and i needed to come up with uh with something so that guy wouldn't you know you know call my bluff and then it got accepted into the rain dance film festival in london so it premiered in london <laughs> and that guy was there <laughs> showed up. Of course. and he said i'm proud of you man i'm proud of you that's and cool he, yeah so uh that was that was neat and so we, we've kind of been pen pals off and on throughout the years so I've just now made uh, some new DVDs uh, of it, uh, like a second run, and I'm just waiting on them to get here. I had to tell everybody, oh, COVID has got the manufacturers all backed up. I didn't realize, and uh, so everyone's, except for two people, said they want a refund. It's like, who are these people? Well, I'm not Amazon, man. <laughs> <laughs> Did you hear that there was this coronavirus thing, you know? Yeah. Yeah, but I can get y'all a copy once it, once it gets here. It should be here any day now. Yeah, I'll buy awesome. one from you. Uh, yeah, yeah. If you ever need any help doing some creative editing stuff, I'm I'm there with you, man. Because I do editing. On, oh, you know, that's good to know. So just hit me Great. up anytime. Okay. You mind uh, playing us another tune before we chat sure. again? Sure. There's some harp. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> 
That's awesome. That was unreal. <laughs> In the the harmonica would cut through the audio a little bit and peek it out, but it's still it's still uh, awesome. That's how it's supposed to sound through my amps, I guess. Maybe mm, distortion. <laughs> I mean, usually I have a Crazy. bullet mic, you know. Yeah. Oh man. So, um, how's you know with COVID going on? How have you been keeping up with everything? You doing live streams? I know you just recently played in Nashville, right? Like a couple nights ago. Yeah, yeah. It's like um, you know, if you get up from your table, you got to wear a mask. But everyone seems to be out, out and about, kind of like kind of going back to normal, but not really. Like just put the mask on when you go up, and there's some weird rules that don't make any sense. Like you can <laughs> come around the bar and talk to them, but you if you're in front, you I don't know, like. It's weird, like inconsistencies and things. Nobody knows how to yeah. do this yet. But a lot of people getting their shots. I got my first one coming up. I just got my first one this morning. Oh, okay. I got mine Monday uh, or Tuesday. Monday. Yeah, I guess I could go in probably before, but I've already set up an appointment and yeah. uh, I'm gonna keep it like it is. And and then I did a tour down to Texas and did some outdoor gigs and. Scott Byron was there and um, nice. Oh, nice of, uh, about everybody already had their second shot already in Texas because of their, uh, I guess a lot of their folks in Texas are kind of pandemic uh, denier kind of think like they're going <laughs> to turn into reptiles or something. And, uh, but that allows uh, the surplus <laughs> to happen, you know, for all the people who want to go out to see shows. So everyone mm -hmm. I talked to had already had their both shots. Wow. And uh, so that was good. And it was outdoors anyway. And we were kind of, it was kind of a guinea pig for the booking agency to see, if, you know, send me out there, see if I die. <laughs> and, uh, everything <laughs> seems to be all right. Yeah. Get back to normal. I mean, but still, everything's kind of canceled uh, till maybe September. And then we'll see what happens. You know, you, you know, nobody knows. I just today I found out that our, European dates have been moved yet again. Uh, yeah, they got moved to 2021, and now they get moved to 2022. So mm. by then, it ought to be all right. But it's um, there's some backlog, and you know, a lot everybody's wanting these dates, you yeah. know. So, but if you just had, keep moving the same thing to the next months or the cor corresponding months of the next year, then that's the best way to go about it, I think. Then you know just trying to book a whole new tour yeah the um i had tickets to one of the shows that got pushed way back mm -hmm. it was down in it was down at headliners i believe down in kentucky oh that yeah. was a year ago i can't even remember yeah who, who was else on the bill but yeah all that so that was with, with um slim cessna yep and that yep. got moved to that got moved to early i think that got moved to next year too around january february or february and march you know, right. same thing so it'll, there's another one where that it takes two two turns right uh we were almost it could have almost happened it's like well, a month too early or maybe you know because everything's kind of seems to be opening up a little more 
like I could see it maybe being feasible now with certain rules of, of in effect, but um, mm -hmm. Slim, it was Slim's call. On, he didn't want to go do it, and then I don't blame him because we weren't quite there yet. Yeah, yeah. Um, back to some of the other songs I wrote down, <clears throat> and I just wanted to hear the the full story from you because everyone you know thinks it's real interesting okay the song the modern day uh murder ballad you did blood on the bluegrass yeah what's the story behind that i keep it's something about vampires in kentucky yeah, it, it factors heavily in the new novel i'm writing um oh good <laughs> it's a hold on um i was there it was a murray state university here in murray kentucky or down the road um Let's see, when did it happen? It happened right, right after I graduated, I think. I remember seeing the vampire kids. It was a cult, uh, but they were like LARPers, you know, like uh, yeah. live action role players, you know, uh, that they, and, uh, they were called the Vamps. It stood for something. Um, well, they were really into Anne Rice and this uh, masquerade game. Uh, like Dungeons and Dragons, but you get to pretend you're a vampire, and they're all kind of latchkey goth kids before the internet, before there was any kind of civilizing forces to show you, like, to be goth, you don't have to murder people. You can wear <laughs> black and listen to The Cure. And that's good enough. <laughs> they were like, I guess we have to suck blood and kill people if we're going to really do this, and uh, they, you know, they were just messed up. A kid named Roderick Farrell, got some uh, kids together, went down to Florida and they murdered his girlfriend's parents with a crowbar and then set out for Louisiana to stalk Anne Rice. And huh. they got picked up in Baton Rouge, I think, and, and sentenced to prison. You know, Roderick got, uh, he was the youngest man in Florida or America or something to be, um, get the, the death sentence. But uh, they, uh, did away with the death sentence and now he's the youngest or for the longest time he was the youngest man on the, uh, with a life sentence and uh, of course now he's all reformed And uh, but anyway they they were just uh, teenagers and uh, it, it was just crazy the details I mean like there was a doc, you can look at the documentary on YouTube Kentucky Vampire Cult or whatever Roderick Farrell and uh, but man it's it's disturbing, very, very disturbing. And I don't, I didn't even put some of the more disturbing things in the book because, like, I, it's just too much. It's just yeah. so I'll be careful when you watch that. It's like, like cruelty to animals is like a thing I don't like, you know, yeah. you kill all the people you want, but like, don't mess with puppy dogs and things like that. But they were like mean, man. And, uh, did it, it, it See, the only reason I know a little bit about this, you mentioned it on stage at one of your shows I was yeah. at, and, and you said he had he had heard the song after you've made it. Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah, we were uh, tour, were touring with uh, Open Up for Reverend Horton Heat down in Florida, and I was at the merch table, and this woman comes up and says, "Are you JD?" And said, yes, ma'am. Uh, and I thought she was just looking for a record or some T-shirts or something. And uh, she goes, "I have a message for you. I'm I'm uh, Roderick." <laughs> Farrell's lawyer and I was like oh crap I'm getting sued <laughs> by a guy in prison but no she said uh, he wanted me to tell you that Blood on the Bluegrass is his favorite song and I was oh, like wow. and I was like for a split second oddly flattered and then I was like creeped yeah. out and like fuck that guy you know <laughs> that's like, crazy you know he's, he gave us a he gave Kentucky a black eye there but uh, yeah. I'm just uh, I'm writing about them and I'm writing about uh, basically like the theme throughout this new book is like the, the phenomenon of the kids um, channeling their spirituality through kind of pop culture tropes. Like there's a lot of girls, especially now that are Instagram witches and things like that, that didn't go to Sunday school like I did. They they were babysat on Harry Potter movies and things and and so they don't i don't even think they realize that that this is like uh that's the mysticism that's the because those books are written well it's like people that are really into that 
fantasy stuff you know it's almost like like the bible or it has that those archetypal union attributes that awaken like a maybe a pagan blood memory but it's channeled through these cheesy hollywood glitzy versions and and it's like interesting to me i mean and that might be exactly the same kind of forces that streamline christianity or whatever your religion is you know uh, it's 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 comparable and it's but it, to me it's kind of weird because there's never been a there's never been pop culture before really like the way it is now there's never been this much recreation time and health and longevity and just um cush situations you know you usually died when you were 40 because your body gave out you know for most of human history you know and yeah and you you relied on jesus and like you had a reason why you were religious because like you wanted it to rain and so you wouldn't starve and yep. and now it's like a fashion sense cool kid club of that's um, a fetish and it's it's and it's it's tied in with spirituality but it's like a pop version of it i don't know it's interesting to me and i'm not judging it all the way because i do th believe that in, in in kind of the power of paganism and and ritual and you know and uh those archetypes that are also tied in with catholicism especially it's neat to me all that's neat but i just this version this um hollywood version of it in this new era is is a um, it's emerging with the whole generation now that are growing up on um apart from the church vacation bible school and the bible and all those things that have been around for so long and it, and it's something similar but glitzy and and kind of entertaining you know coming in that's more pagan but just as um, archetypal and i don't know i just i'm playing around with all that now yeah when when will that be released do you have a date in mind or no? i don't i don't even know if anyone's going to publish it i'm writing a book i, I want to see written you know, that's really what it is. I want to I want to think about these things. It's a sequel to The Vine That Ate the South, but it is not a uh, it's not a folklore based thing. It is a, a right. nightmare journal, basically, that I've had these dreams and I'm trying to sequence them in a way to where they all flow together so they can be novelized with a thread through them and then retcon that somehow back to The Vine That Ate the South so it can be a sequel so it's a very hard project it's taken a long time but i'm not in a hurry uh i'm almost done i just have like a, a climactic scene to write um a showdown with these vampire kids and uh and then uh and then i'll i'll submit it to the publishers or whoever wants to take a look at it but again i'm just writing what i want to see written right what t what time of do you write the most or when are you most creative that you feel this today was the first day that I tried to put myself back on a normal schedule by getting up early and going to a coffee shop and I did it and my um but I have been writing throughout the night till dawn because it, the feeling of night uh goes well with what I'm writing about but I, um, maybe I'm using the daytime to edit a little more, which I'm not supposed to do until I'm done. But the nature of this project is weird because I have to constantly edit as I'm writing because this is a bizarre, unrelated dream journal that if you put this here and then you write something, well, that now that makes that look that, that has to go over here now. But you cut it in half and take the first half, put it over here. It's this Tetris <laughs> game of storytelling that because it's all random, but you, it, to novelize it, you have to make it go, oh, OK, you have to flow through it. That's hard to do. And I'm, I'm removing entire sections and plopping it aside in a different, um, you know, uh, uh, document. Maybe that'll be uh, maybe that'll be for the third book, you know, um, I'm, I'm streamlining it now and I'm almost done. If I could just write this, uh, this, the showdown scene, I'll be done. And then I'll, uh, then I'm going to illustrate it, but I'll do that while I'm waiting for the publisher to get back to me. Nice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cool. We, um, we've got some questions here. We like to ask everyone. Okay. 
there's just quick little things we like to run by people first basically what's an artist that you would like to work with that you haven't already Mm. you have someone in mind as far as music's concerned well i I like to go with the older ones because they they won't be around forever so tom waits is my dad's age is that i mean people live longer now but like you you never know especially with covid around and everything i'd like to meet him at least Uh, you know i don't think he would work with me but you know (laughs) <laughs> um i just would like to uh, shake his hand if he would do that um uh i have uh lee sexton was the one that i really w- sought out to meet he was like again i put the thing up on instagram the other day i don't know if you saw it but um when he just recently passed away so i, I did a eulogy for him on- online and i didn't go to the funeral but uh you know i was let their families just do that and but i wanted to show my respect because I, I did get to meet him but i i I, I went um, after seeing Searching for the Wrong Eye in Jesus. I became obsessed with getting, wanting to meet him because he's in Kentucky. He's on the other side of the state, but it doesn't matter. But I just want to set up a meeting, and like I had blown him up so important in my mind, he was like Elvis to me. Like, I'm, and I was asking, you know, who's his agent? You know, who like who who do I go? Who do I have to talk to? And everyone's like, I don't know. You know, does anyone have a phone number? Uh, who would I? How would I go about this? And I, no one had any information for me. And then it, like a year or two went by, and it just like kind of clicked one day. I'm like, I wonder if he's in the phone book, you know? So I, <laughs> I called four one one, and the recording came on. And said, what listing? And I said, Lee Sexton. What county or whatever? What city? Line Fork, Let, uh, Letcher County stand by and it it immediately connected me to hello like i didn't have time to prepare or anything it just connected me like ring hello and like um i'm on the spot and and i'm a fanboy and i'm trying to (laughs) catch up with what just happened because this has been so long in the waiting and uh, i was asked if i could come get a banjo lesson from him and he said yeah he does one every thursday night or whatever at the schoolhouse and he gave me directions, you know, like an old timer where like turn left at the third low water bridge and, you know, at, you know, by the chicken coop, you know, all this stuff, you know, like, and the GPS wouldn't have worked anyway. Cause uh, it, the mountains are so high, they blocked the signals. So like, it was just a spinning question mark about halfway through the journey, uh, but I found the place and he couldn't have been any nicer, like a, like your grandpa, you know, and I did it, I went back a second time. Each time I filmed him, and so I go back and learn what he was doing. Mm-hmm. And uh, it was just great. And uh, I feel like, you know, it was, uh, that was kind of like my uh, bucket list guy. E- anything else, it would be, I have met uh, harmonica players. Uh, Junior Wells gave me a little harmonica lesson. He was played for Muddy Waters. You know, um, I would have loved to have met met uh roscoe of course he died when i was like uh nine um but uh yeah i i you know i've gotten to meet a lot of cool people that's another thing is i'm thankful for is a i didn't even expect to be able to go to europe and and uh meet these cool people you know these you know famous people or not you know i didn't get into this racket even suspecting that could ever happen. I just wanted to play and, you know, make money playing bars, playing blues and, and, uh, and then all this other wonderful stuff happened. So that was, it's been good. I don't really have any, I don't really, I'd say Tom Waits only cause I like his music, but you know, we could, you know, that's enough. You know, I, I'm, I am happy with what I've got. Okay. I got to play harmonica for Merle Haggard and meet him and, um, a tour with Robert Plant and you know I've, I've got to you know Reverend Horton Heat is like a friend and I can't even believe that you know it's just uh it's that's good enough I, I never expected any of this so it's just uh been yeah cool. yeah <laughs> all right question two this is more to settle a bet between Justin and I we we're taking a running tally with everyone we talk to so if you right. had to pick Beatles or Stones um, that's tough because I've, I, I don't, I don't, um, 
I mean, I think Stones would be like what I would typically say. And I've heard, you know, and I, but I like the Beatles too. I like their creativity. And like, I understand the wanting to change all the, you know, just what you do, keep people guessing and like dabble in other styles of music. You're like, mm. Stones is like, you know, kind of more of my blue collar, like what I'd say off the top of my head. But I, you know, I guess, uh, but, uh, you know, I, to be honest, it's, it's both, but uh, we'll say Stones just because, like, I got, if it wasn't for the yes. Rolling Stones, if it wasn't for the Rolling Stones, uh, my dad would not have gotten into blues. I think that them and the uh, Yard Nerds and the mm-hmm. Animals mm-hmm. and John Mayall were um, his entryway drug to digging back to older blues. And those records are what got me here today. So I'll say them just even though both are true, <laughs> you know, yeah, technically, technically, we both, we both, I, if appreciate, I had to pick, you know, she ate both too, but yeah, mm-hmm. you hate uh, both. No, we both like both, but I'm more oh. Beatles. He's more stuff. So. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. So we're like Donnie Osmond and Marie, a little bit country, a little bit rough, <laughs> <laughs> but definitely not Donnie Marie. Yeah. Right. <laughs> All right. Here's one for you. All right. What's a guilty pleasure of yours as far as music? Like, what's something you'd listen to that somebody probably wouldn't guess that you listen to? Or... Well, we were, I was just talking with this, uh, about this with Miranda, uh, that uh, I have no guilt over anything I listen to because I listened, I discovered this about myself is I love melody. So it mm-hmm. could be a pop song, it could be disco, mm-hmm. it could be anything, it could be, uh, uh, I mean, I, I like the Bee Gees, uh, was that Saturday Night Fever or whatever? I mean, yeah. I don't own it, but like it comes on or Dancing Queen by ABBA. I mean, those are should be, <laughs> I should be drummed out of uh, off of planet Earth, but um, but no, I like melodies, I like, I like catchy things. I like, and I was, but I like, I found that I, I like things that have like a blues note or a minor note in it, something dark, like Eurythmics. Uh, mm. sweet dreams are made of these or whatever like there's a there's a darkness underneath I even like Billy Jean and it's a it's a minor 12 bar blues pattern actually when you get down to it and analyze the songs there's a lot of stuff uh, Quincy Jones did that in Stevie Wonder I like mm. that uh, James Brown now, none of that's a guilty pleasure those are right. cool things to say but heck <laughs> I'll say I'll embarrass myself here. The first, uh, the first time I heard Georgia on my mind was Michael. What's his name? Uh, B- Buble. No, no, before Bolton. the long haired guy. Bolton. Bolton. Michael Bolton. Michael version. Bolton. When I first, <laughs> it was his version of Georgia on my mind. The first time I ever heard that song, Georgia, no, Georgia. You know, and it's like cheesy <laughs> as hell now. I like, go back and look, listen to it, but like I remember, like, what's that song? <laughs> thinking he wrote it or something when i was like yeah. 15 or something so that's, that's embarrassing funny. there you go <laughs> <laughs> all right say so you could wake up to wake up tomorrow and you could play uh any instrument that you don't play now you could play the hell out of it what are you uh, thinking it'd be cajun accordion i've, nice. I've got uh, i've got some uh I've got three three of them different keys and uh it's tricky and you wouldn't think it'd be hard for me because it's laid out like a harmonica, like push, pull is blow, draw, do, 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 do. But they, but there's things they do. Mm-hmm. There's that left side that's always doing this, but you're having to do this at different intervals mm-hmm. because it's, it's not always going to be this. It's not always going to be this. It's, yeah. uh, 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 you know, like it's, it's like robotic. <laughs> Yeah, but that has to always be doing that. So how do you, I can't, it's like this kind of thing, you know, how do you, how do you do that? And then, and, I, and you, if, you, if I'm playing it, you can see my mouth doing the, the harmonica mime. Mm-hmm. You see my eyes glazing over and drool starts forming. I'm like, it's very hard. I don't see how they do it. And then all this like flam stuff on the right hand. And, but yeah, it, it all, it all comes from the left arm. It's, you know, this, this, it's not this, it's this, you know, like a bellows is just one way. It's like, you know, stoking Driving. a fire. It's very hard. It's, it's, uh, 
patting your head, rubbing your stomach, and chewing gum and all that stuff. Yeah. Jeez. Um, the last one here is pretty basic, but what's your idea of just a good ass time? Like, what would you prefer to do on, say, a Saturday night? You know, what what's mm. just a good time in your opinion? Oh man. Yeah. It depends on what mode I'm in. Again, I, I, these are not, I'm not trying to be uh, difficult. Uh, I have a Jekyll and Hyde in me. I had, so like there'd be a wild time and then there'd be a time by myself up here writing, which is no fun, but that's like, I think I have more fun doing that than anything playing in my mind and making anything I want have happen. You can't do that in real life but you can get random stuff happening at you in real life and you can't have one without the other because uh, in order to be fully fledged, you need to be both kinds of people, thoughtful and daring. And uh, so these days I'm got ready to go out and have a good time. Uh, seen a show, playing a show, ha seen some weird shit go down because I'm, you know, I think we're all at that level right now because of quarantine. <laughs> Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I do, I do have just as much fun if I'm in that mo uh, writing mode, it, it is a blast, but like no one can see or, in, or be there with me, unfortunately. What's one of, what's one of, uh, one of the craziest things you've seen in a live show or. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if you mm -hmm. can tell it on, on here. Oh man. Uh, there, there was a guy that had a seizure while we were playing um, Ghost Riders in the Sky. This is the Joe Buck era. And uh, not to make fun or anything, but like he was so excited by like, yippee, uh, yay. He like, and everyone's like, yeah, like at the same time that he like passed out and had a seizure. And we saw him kept going. We didn't even know until we, I'm like, look up. And then it's like the ambulance had come and this guy's like getting pulled off on a stretcher and he's like, still doing the, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And then, oh, um, oh well, I'll tell you one thing is uh, in Spain. Oh, man. Yeah, it's a place called Hell Dorado. We were doing a hip shake and a sea of Spaniards out there just going nuts. Um, all of them into us. Like, this is a great, this is like one of the best gigs ever. Everyone's like, just, and I'm like taking advantage i'm stretching this song out because i want to keep them dancing i'm gonna make this song 30 <laughs> minutes long if i can and so in order to do that we got to vamp down high and low you know kind of do interesting things and so like i, I it, the song goes doom, 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 and um so i i just keep making it go down lower and lower and like quiet and, uh, just getting down real low, real quiet, and I'm scrunching down, and the bass player's scrunching down, the guitar player's scrunching, and the whole audience goes down. They're all getting down. We're playing, you know. We're on the same wavelength, and we're all, like, down on our knees almost. And I look back at the drummer. I go, you know, like, and he goes, he's coming back in, drum roll, hit in full volume. Everybody jumps up, and then somehow – this Spaniard just like, just, I don't know if he got a leg lift. He just goes flying to the ceiling in this tall place, <laughs> like in Blues Brothers in the church scene. I don't know where they, yeah. somehow they can fly. Yeah. <laughs> and I look back at the drummer and he's like, and I'm like, what, how did that even happen? This guy just went <laughs> like a rocket when we hit in on that note. And it's like, he just shot through the air like like 50 feet or something i'm not <laughs> wow. i'm not lying i don't know how that happened he must have gotten a foothold like when they're ready to like throw me up you know so well, those airbag feet. seat ejectors or <laughs> yeah, it was like a yeah, eject ejection sh seat <laughs> oh my gosh yeah that oh, was man. like one of the funniest things i've ever seen because it just seemed <laughs> impossible and it was right out of the blues brothers you know like the james brown yeah. church scene <laughs> All right. Well, I think we've taken enough of your time. We definitely want to have you back on in the future sometime. Yeah. Um, before we go, though, can can you do another song for us and then maybe talk about where people can find your music or buy your merch and all that good stuff? Yeah. Um, 
jdwilkes.com or legendaryshackshakers.com or I have an Etsy store called uh, Camp Kitch, K-A-M-P-K-I-T-C-H, K-I-T-S-C-H, Kitch, uh, or a JD's Book Club. That's all on Etsy. And uh, Instagram has all those links. There's a Patreon page if anyone's interested. Let me see if I put this in a different tuning. song yeah. all right well thanks like for I having said, me on yeah do it again sometime we'd like to you know we started this uh at the beginning once all the pandemic hit we'd like to start doing these in person at some point so mm -hmm. we'll catch you on the road sometime or before a show or something It'd be great yeah yeah it'd be great uh we're not too far away right no no nope. go, go to louisville if i recall going to go to head yeah we're in central indiana so okay not, not too bad your buddy uh yeah. reverend peyton lives pretty close oh yeah cool so yeah i did a tour with them uh when dom flemings uh, a couple of years ago yeah and, uh, doing like I, was, I was there yeah education tour that was fun that was a little different style I, yeah like uh, you were more solo act that yeah that was yeah totally yeah i was just kind of like the the warm-up act uh but me and dom are gonna go do uh supposedly uh, this is holding so far the dates for 2022 uh, uh me and him are gonna do a european tour next year uh, and uh, oh great hopefully that'll hold so but you never know so far right. so good. <clears throat> i made um i made dom some bones to play out of deer shins because i'm a taxidermist oh, I'm for a living <clears throat> but reverend do you, ever, uh, to him. do you ever um make gaps you know you know uh, gap well that's a sideshow term it's like basically like what a, a jackalope is oh uh, i haven't but i i could like where yeah. you combine animals to make a mythological creature out of real fur and right stuff. i did um i did a art show I went to a liberal arts school downtown Indianapolis, Heron School of Art for mm -hmm. photography, but we did all kinds of different shit. But um, I did um, one based off like a nightmare, things that what well, people are scared of coyotes, coyotes, and they go out in the woods or whatever, and they dream up something bigger than what it really is. Right. They're scared to death of it. So I kind of played on that and I made a, I think it was like six foot tall. Mm -hmm coyote all real furs coyotes that i trapped yeah uh -huh. and um and it had leg extensions wide eyes teeth open and i extended oh, wow. the jaw down with the fangs it was crazy looking yeah and i ended up selling it to a guy and he picked he, some elaborate house that he had his 
really interesting guy. Anyway, he has it next to a stripper pole he has in his living room. <laughs> Did you ever go out in the woods and put it out there hoping somebody'd see it and get scared? <laughs> I had it when I I was uh renting a barn out. I was living in a barn and I'd prop it up to when people come through the door. Yeah. It'd be right <laughs> above them, freak them out. <laughs> if you ever have a uh, Jamie Barrier from the Pine Hill Haints on your show, they have a great story about uh, an effigy they made of a banshee that they hid in the woods <laughs> and then took some kids out there to scare them. I won't give away the punchline, but uh, you yep. should have them on your show. He, he's a, he's a, they got, he's full of stories and he's a great writer. And one of the people that made me want to write because he too was just writing for the love of it and uh, just making little zines, you know, and right them on the road, you know, so yeah, we'd, we'd love to have them on. Yeah. I've seen them a few times and I know you're good friends with them and mm -hmm. yeah, they'd, they'd be great for us. Yeah. So. Ask them about the Banshee uh, okay. epic or the mannequin. Yeah. Will do. <laughs> cool. All right. We'll catch you uh, next time. All right. Thanks for having me on and, uh, and send me a link uh, and I'll share it out and uh, do a little yeah. pub. Yeah. Will do. Thanks, right. Shady. Y'all have a good night.